Hello everyone and welcome to the third lecture of this current topics in heritage science series of the Iperion HS Academy, organized by emerging professionals in the frame of the Iperion Heritage Science Project and the European Research Infrastructure for Heritage Science. My name is Diego Quintero Balvas and I'm a postdoc at the National Institute of Optics in Florence and I'll be moderating today's lecture. Our topic today is chromatographic analysis, a technique that has many applications in the heritage science field. In particular, today we will be addressing the characterization of, of purple pigments in textiles. The recording of this lecture will be available later on the IRIT's uh, YouTube channel. And at the end of the lecture, you will receive a survey. Please take a few seconds to let us know your opinion. And be aware that the attendance confirmation of this lecture will be released after the survey submission. You can ask questions through the Q&A function at the bottom of the bar of the Zoom window. And if you are experiencing any technical difficulties, you can contact us using the chat. Without further ado, I'll present, uh, I will introduce our speaker, uh, Professor Z. Koren. He is Professor Emeritus from the Department of Chemical Engineering at the Shankar College of Engineering, Design and Art in Israel. He has been the director of the Elustein Center of the Analysis of Ancient Artifacts at Shankar since the center's inception in 1991. Prior to that, he was the head of the Department of Chemistry at the Cooper Union in New York. He received his bachelor's degree in chemistry and mathematics from the Brooklyn College of and his uh, PhD in physical chemistry from the City University of New York. Professor Corinne, thank you, and the floor is yours. Okay, hello everybody. Too bad I can't be with you, and I can't see all of you, but it's great to be here also. Thank you very much, Diego, for the introduction. And I will present the share screen. Let me start that into the first slide which you see right over here. And let me get rid of the floating meeting controls. Great. And let me start the show. OK. Um, as I said, thank you very much. It's great to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Hello, everybody, wherever you are in the world. Actually, the topic today is a twofold topic. It will deal with a bit of chromatography and a lot of purple pigments, a uh, two-pronged uh, approach into the problem. So here's the, uh, my design of the slides, chromatographic analyses of Malaskan purple pigments. It's a live broadcast from Israel near Tel Aviv, Ramat Gan, I'm the director of the Edelstein Center for the Analysis of Ancient Artifacts and also a faculty member of the Department of Chemical Engineering right over here. Okay, this is, let me start off. There's a whole bunch of topics, a lot of material to put into just half an hour. And uh, so um, let me get started. There's a very nice quotation, I think, that I've seen. And it says that the ancient primitive, I emphasize the word primitive dyer, was an advanced chemist. And who said that? I just did right over here, November 17th, Iperion, Svikoren. And it also, if you want to learn more about the modern chemistry um, of the wonders of the ancient primitive dyer, you can check up my article. I'll show you the website at the end of the lecture also, where you can download uh, most of my articles. And, also, one of the very nice things, I like to combine different things together, and Robert Browning, the English poet, in his poem, Popularity, in 1855, he talked about the purple pigment from sea snails as the dye of dyes. That's a wonderful uh, expression. There's, of course, the biblical song of songs. This is the exquisite, the uh, apex of dyes, the dye of dyes, this purple pigment. And I also spoke about that and talked about it in one of my articles in uh, published a few years ago about the archaeological shades of purple. Now, many of you, and I imagine that many of you from different walks of life, as they say, perhaps conservators, scientists, uh, curators, museum officials, etc. 
the various analytical methods uh, that we use in uh, in science in general, not just in chemistry, in biology, in physics, and they lo we love acronyms. We love these abbreviations, FAB and uh, DESI and uh, and DAD. We love all of those. And let me just get the laser pointer over here. TERS and, like I said, TOF and DRIFTS and DAD, etc. Many, many, many wonderful analyses for different types of samples. But again, let me take one of the uh, classic uh, combination of Gilbert and Sullivan, uh, the light opera specialist. I love seeing them in New York, uh, not them themselves, because it's 1885, not that old. But in the Mikado, there's a famous expression, let the punishment fit the crime. And wonderful song, amazing, the Mikado. Uh, I say, let the analysis fit the sample, because I've seen, unfortunately, different, uh, from my field, different methods being used and tried uh, for analyzing dyes and pigments. Okay, but the ultimate method, which I'll show you very shortly, is HPLC. I'll talk a little bit about that, but a little bit of my own history in the beginning, as we say, of my own purple dye analyses from about 30 years ago, which uh, many of you perhaps were not even around in this world 30 years ago. Uh, the, there are various ancient uh, Phoenician uh, installations around uh, what is now Israel and of course in Lebanon, Syria, in the Eastern Mediterranean, such as this one in Teldor, sixth century uh, BCE. And the first, this is my first uh, purple pigment analysis, I should say, before I got an HBLC in 1993, before they were even popular. And this very uh, interesting limestone, uh, this is under a microscope, but when you look at it, it, it looks like there's a dirt on this piece of limestone. You have to understand the context where it was found in these dying vat installations, as it turns out. And I had, of course, who doesn't, uh, pure indigo. And uh, I also have the dibromal indigo, the main component of the purple pigment, to uh, take a look at the visible spectrum in uh, dissolved in dimethyl formamid. Um, and you get a very nice blue solution, by the way, even dibromal indigo, which is in a solid, a reddish purple pigment. And the archaeological sample was 600. And there's no natural dye that I know of that absorbs at around 600, except for the purple pigment and uh, indigo, of course, around 600. So I surmised that it is, in fact, a purple pigment from a purple pigment or purple dye installation. And because it is a little bit higher than 600 nanometers, dibromo indigo 598, with the method that I used, I surmise that it not only is there dibromo indigo, there could be also uh, some other indigoids. And of course, it is true, uh, there is monobromo indigo, et cetera, in there also, um, which is at a, a higher than uh, 600, but below 613 or 615. Anyway, that was my first introduction to Malaskan purple pigments. And then when I got an HPLC, uh, we did a lot of what is known in the field, microscale archaeological chemistry, a lot of extractions, uh, and a wonderful high-performance liquid chromatography. Some people call it high pressure, by the way. Uh, the better name is high performance. Uh, it works at high pressures, but high performance liquid chromatography, of course, with a photo diode array detector, which is very nice uh, to take a look at. It gives you a very nice uh, spectrum in the UV and the UV and in invisible. And this is the workhorse. This is the workhorse and the main method of dye analyses for, um, for ancient, uh, ancient pigments and ancient colorants in general. But there's two things. I also put into this particular slide the optimal extraction method. Without going into too much detail, there are basically two things that those who are non-scientists have to ask themselves. And you using pure conservatories Okay, when you give over samples, uh, is the right method being used for the, for the right samples? And also, what is the method, what is the extraction method that is being used in order to perform these analyses? My favorite and the optimal one is dimethyl sulfoxide at very high temperature. 
100 to 150 degrees Celsius and in the dark. So you need to know the method uh, of analysis and also the extraction method. And HPLC, this is nothing like the HPLC. HPLC gives you a full, the, the full gamut of, of detectable dyes. I say that the HPLC sees the invisible. You can see in this purple pigment, which comes out of this particular snail, this is the famous Murex trunculus or Hexaflex trunculus. It's a very nice bloody, blood red uh, pigment. To the eye, of course, it has a certain coloration, but hiding in this particular pigment is a whole bunch of different colorants, even yellow, and there's, of course, indigo blue, and uh, different types of reds in there also. And there is nothing like HPLC to give you about 10 different colorants, if not more, even the trace ones you can get by that. And it gives you a fingerprint. You'll know more about it as I talk about chemical fingerprinting, uh, this particular pigment and the reason for it. Anyway, um, one of the nice things you get out of the HPLC, uh, without, again, if you don't go, those of you who are not analysts, you get a chromatographic property, which is the retention time, uh, based on when the dye comes out of the uh, Lucian column, when does it uh, come out of the uh, uh, of the column after being um, washed out of the column, eluded, we say. And this can be a unique uh, predictor of the particular dye, but it's not enough. The HPLC also gives you a spectrometric property, the UV visible spectrum of each component, and you can see here the isotin, uh, brominated isotin, indigo, monobromo indigo, dibromo indigo. These are basically also more or less the colors of these particular colorants and a whole bunch of indirubins, uh, brominated and uh, isomeric uh, indirubins to uh, the indigoids, et cetera. But in archeological uh, analyses that I, not just I have done, but uh, others have also done, the main components that you see in archaeological samples are indigo, um, the bluish one, monobromo indigo and dibromo indigo, the reddish purple, dibromo indigo. Interestingly, monobromo indigo is like an in-between color. It's a separate component. It's not a mixture of indigo and dibromo indigo, but it, in, in looks, in appearance, it's a violet kind of color, as you see here. But also in archaeological samples, besides these three indigoids, Dibromine the rubin also stars in it. It's not a big, usually, it's not a big component, but it's of the uh, other trace um, com components, it's usually um, a significant in there. Okay, now in the beginning of dye analysis, what's so great about HPLC? Uh, Pfister did amazing work by combining different chemical reagents to dyes, known dyes. And you see the color that gets that you get that is obtained, and you compare it with standards. And this way, it was able to determine what the dyes were in archaeological samples. But uh, I maybe I'm exaggerating a bit. But you need an ultra uh, macro materials relative to what we need today. Today, I, the the uh, analyses or the test, the sampling, I should say, uh, I wrote down micro destructive. Not only are they micro-destructive, I say they're even nano-destructive, that if you can see it with a magnifying glass, as uh, Sherlock and Holmes are seeing right over here, that's big enough in order to do the sample. We, we uh, you'll see who in, in a second. When you take a look at um, analyses that HPLC can do, it can do analyses on individual fiber, not a yarn made up of a number of fibers, but a single fiber that even when it, it may be invisible to the naked eye, but of course, under the microscope, if you can see it, of course, you have to be able to analyze it. You, you can do a lot of uh, amazing stuff, such as this one that uh, Christopher Hecken, uh, some of you may know her from Antwerp, uh, gave me a sample of this polychromic, uh, beautiful textile material from about 1500 years ago, late Roman period Egyptian textile. And for this beautiful textile, 1500, it's not very ancient. We learned some extremely important uh, caveats involved with archaeological textiles that have purple. Now, under the microscope, when I first did an analysis, 
of uh, these uh, of some of these yarns, I I I got a nice monoskin pigment. But then looking more carefully under the microscope, I can tell that each well each yarn that I was analyzing really was composed of three different colors. You can see even here, there's a blue, there's a kind of a reddish and a yellowish. Well, the yellowish is undyed wool. You know, as you know, wool gets yellowed, oxidized over the years, and it turns uh, yellow, it's undyed yellow. So in order to see, in order to get a full picture of what's going on over here, you have to analyze each individual fiber of this particular yarn. It took me a whole day with these uh, with these tweezers, very sharp tweezers, uh, which uh, very sharp point, but under the microscope, it looks like a bulldozer. Here's a picture of uh, under the microscope where finally after a full day and you can't breathe underneath because all the fibers will go away, will be blown away, grabbing a, yellow, a blue one and then also uh, grabbing a reddish one we got some very interesting results that uh, here's the, um, the, chrom the chromatogram from this HPLC, indigo, monobromo, indigo, dibromo, indigo. These three indigoids that I spoke about before are present, but in the UV, you can also see dibromo in the rubin. This is uh, visualized at 600 nanometers. Okay, in, in, and I will summarize later on what the significance of these um, analyses were um, towards the end of my talk. But this is just to, uh, to, to emphasize the fact that even a single fiber can give you, which is amazing, can give you such a wonderful chromatogram as if uh, it was dyed today. Now, the various archaeological sites that I was working with, I'm not an archaeologist, but Archaeologists, museum officials have given me samples from different parts. I'm mostly familiar with the Eastern Mediterranean, what's around Israel, currently Israel, ancient Israel, uh, with the Phoenician sites that are over here. And many of you have heard around the Dead Sea, of course, there's Qumran and there's Masada, the famous Masada. Uh, some of you may have actually climbed it. Uh, don't do it in the heat of the summer, but it's an amazing Herodian complex. Uh, without going too much about it, the Qumran, the Dead Sea Scrolls, of course, in the Judean desert sites. Of course, organic uh, materials survive in deserts like Judean Desert and other deserts in uh, Saudi Arabia. snails. This isn't easy to say, purple pigment producing snails, but I just did. Now, which are they? Now, many of you perhaps would know that there's a club med of sea snails. The three most famous ones, uh, Murex or Bolinus brandaris, the spiky one, and the beautiful banded one, the Murex trunculus or hexaplex trunculus today, and the purple hemostoma, stramonita hemostoma, they go under different names, etc. Brandaris trunculus, Hemostoma basically survived wonderful uh, lips over here on the hemostoma. Now, uh, these snails were not just for royalty and for generals, they're also biblical. Um, they were used for biblical colors, for biblical dyes. Um, <clears throat> one of them in the Bible is known as Argoman, which is royal purple or priestly purple. And um, to give you an idea uh, very shortly of what the royal purple might have been, uh, there's also a biblical blue, if you take a look at your uh, Bibles, which is known as Techelet. Some of you may have heard of that. Now, in order to do the analyses, you need standards. You can either buy them from Sigma or some other chemical supply house. But there's, of course, if you want to get the real McCoy, as we say in Americanese, the real snails, the real sources, you have to die for snails, sea snails. So northern Israel... There's, uh, they love, by the way, vegetation. All this algae, all this foliage and, and um, the green that you see over here. In an open sea, I have not that I've looked at it everywhere. I haven't seen uh, these Murex uh, snails in open seas, but they love the rock, the rocky terrain and the nice green uh, uh, vegetation over here on the shore. 
we got a nice basket full of snails. One of them is help, yelling help because they know what's going to happen to them. Well, we do the dye extractions on various places. You break the snail, you show the hyperbranchial gland, the, you break the shell, you expose it, you cut it, and take a look what happens. First, a, it's, not, it's colorless or white, and it turns yellow under the sun and oxygen, and then eventually it turns spontaneously into the reddish purple pigment or bluish purple pigment, depending on the snail that you're talking about. So um, th as far as these uh, snails are concerned, how do they, uh, the chromatographic separation that I talked about before, you get a wonderful picture of these particular snails, uh, of these particular pigments like I talked about before. Yes, the main dyes again, these three snails, keep that in mind, the blue, the violet, and the reddish uh, snails. Now, purple was used in history as a paint pigment, as many of you know, almost 4,000 years ago in Akrotiri and in other sites along the Aegean, purple was used as a paint pigment. And it was also one of the uh, purple pigments that I looked at as a paint pigment was a, on a King Darius uh, jar, which you'll see in a second. King Darius the Great. They were always called the Great. They weren't called King such and such the so-so. It was always King Darius the Great the first, and this is when he lived from 526 or 485 BCE. This is a uh, stone sculpture from uh, Iran. And this is a beautiful marble jar in the Bible Lands Museum in Jerusalem. Not a big museum, but a nice size museum uh, of, of uh, Bible Lands from all over the uh, Mediterranean, the Middle East. Um, this is the, uh, the size of it. Dated to about 486 BCE. Why? As you'll see in a second. I call this, and, and others too, a Persian Rosetta Stone, but the Rosetta Stone had only three uh, languages or inscriptions on it. This has four. The three inscriptions, Old Persian, Elamite, and Akkadian, all written in cuneiform scripts, but also there's Egyptian hieroglyphics. And uh, those who are aware of how to read Egyptian hieroglyphics from the top to the bottom, King of Upper and Lower Egypt, Lord of the Two Lands, the cartouche, what's called the cartouche right in here, is the name of the king Darius or Daryavaush in ancient languages, living eternally, year 36. I love this, living eternally. Okay, that's hope, that's wishful and hopeful thinking. Year 36 to his reign was 486 BCE. Well, unfortunately, King Darius did not live eternally. He died. Yes, in year 36 of his reign in 486 BCE. What can I do? This is King Darius the first. But the reason I got into this picture of when we analyze it, there were purple residues here and there on the outside of this particular marble jar. Amazing. Of course, just because it's purplish doesn't mean it's the real purple from sea snails. You have to do the analysis. All analysis, let me go back to this a second. Basically, the work of any scientist, any analytical scientist, has to stand up in a court of uh, scientific law, let's call it. It has to be beyond a reasonable doubt, beyond any, any doubt whatsoever. Okay, when we analyze this particular pigment, sure enough, you get dibromo indigo, which is only from sea snails, monobromo indigo too. Indigo can come from plants as well, as you well know. And uh, but the brominated species that you see over here, highlighted in their colors, can only come from sea snails. In other words, this 2,500-year-old uh, paint pigment was the purple pigment from sea snails. And when I did this analysis and published in uh, 2008, I started thinking, wait a second. Okay, at this point in time, I'm talking about what is it? Uh, uh, nearly 15 years ago, at this point in time, it is uh, relatively easy to determine if a pigment is from a sea snail, a Malaskan pigment. But the question that I was asking myself, can I determine the uh, zoological or biological provenance of these pigments? In other words, was it the trunculus? Was it the brandaris? Was it a hemostoma? So I did analyses 
on a number of different uh, modern snails as well as archaeological samples and um, did these uh, qualitative and quantitative analyses where you could see, let me go up one at a time, where you could see the different components, the yellowish uh, isotins and the indigo quantification in the rubin, monobromo indigo in this uh, um, die in this bar chart, as well as dibromo indigo and all the other components. And when you look at it without doing a fancy statistical analysis, I know there are very nice uh, statistical analyses like principal component analysis and others that I've also done and uh, spoken about. But when you look at it, you notice, wait a second, the common denominator, the common die among all of these is monobromo indigo. Monobromo indigo is the key to all. In other words, if you know, if you detect using the right extraction procedure and HPLC, if you detect a significant amount of monobromo indigo, that means that the trunculus was definitely used. Uh, what about the other snails? We'll see about the other snails in a minute or two. So the trunculus is different from all the other snails that uh, monobromo indigo is the key, as I said, and I hate to break it to all the sea snails of the world, but it's not a democracy there, sorry. Not all snails were created equal, what can I do? There are, monobromo indigo is the key to the trunculus snail. Not only that, I've noticed among my many analyses that there are two types of trunculus, two varieties, let's call it subspecies. I'm not a zoologist, so I don't know if I can use the actual word subspecies, but two varieties of trunculus, ones that give you a reddish purple pigment and one that gives you a violet or bluish purple pigment. So that this paint pigment that we saw, the Darius pigment, you see that it is rich. It's first of all, it's reddish purple, obviously to the uh, naked eye, and you, once you know that it's a purple, it's a Malaskan purple pigment, obviously there's a lot of dibromo indigo. So this is from a snail that I call dibromo indigo rich trunculus snail. As you can obviously see, it also has monobromo indigo. Now purple is a textile dye. These are purples as a paint pigment, which is very easy. You just extract the uh, pigment out and then you add some adhesive to it, some binder, and you paint with it. To use the purple pigment and convert it to a textile dye is much more a much more difficult biochemical process. And um, the various ancient Phoenician purple dyeing vats that we have seen from ancient Israel and other places uh, from 9th century BC, 7th century, uh, you can't really tell the curvature here, but there's a nice curvature on this particular potchard and that if you continue it, you extrapolate it around, these potchards would belong to vats that could have held hundreds of liters of dye solution. And you can still see, of course, the purple pigment, which I analyze, and it's, of course, the real purple. Now, how did they do the dyeing in ancient times? Um, like I said, dyeing with the purple pigment is much more difficult than using it as a paint pigment. So let's take the solid pigment. Let's say it has dibromo indigo in it, a nice amount of dibromo indigo and other uh, indigoids. Okay, now it's reddish. So when you put it into water, you get, a, uh, you get a solution that looks reddish, but you have to dissolve this pigment in any kind of dyeing, whether it's uh, modern or ancient, the colorant has to be dissolved in water. But as many of you have used indigo, uh, you know that indigo does not dissolve in the water. You have to actually dissolve it. So the way you dissolve it is by a process known as reduction. And what is amazing is that they use the bacteria that's in the meaty glands as reducing agents, but that's not enough. You also needed an alkaline basic environment, the pH above nine, in order to create anions. With these anions, you have a redu a soluble dye. And, Pl and Pliny or Pliny or Plinius, however you pronounce his name, talked about a salt, Salim, and I wrote about it that he was completely right. 
You can use, for example, sodium carbonate, a natural salt, which is also an alkaline salt uh, for this process. Now, so you have now this green, it's a green solution, by the way, it's a greenish uh, reduced solution. What do you do? How do you do the dyeing? Well, you take a sheep. Okay, that's to wake you up. You shear the wool of the sheep, you wash it, you got rose, etc. When you put the wool into the green solution, obviously it takes on a green color, but take a look what happens when you raise it in the air and the oxygen in the air causes the reduced uh, soluble dye to go back to become uh, an oxidized form. Here you go, up, up, up in the air. Voila, you get a beautiful purple uh, dying and the amazing thing if you think about it okay here's purple outside of the wool here's purple inside the wool this is how they dyed it and this is the real uh, stuff this is what I did uh, and here are your green solution you put the dye in there in the air it's green and then becomes uh, this nice purple etc now as far as the royal purple or our biblical argaman as we call it. Uh, let's take a look at some of these textiles that I analyzed. One from Masada, a real purple textile. And it was found near uh, King Herod, the one who built this fortress palace in the first century BC or BCE. In the first century BC, uh, he had um, this Masada complex. You could see the niches in the floor. He had a throne room and nearby, he had, there was this textile that was found, uh, and coins belonging to King Herod also separately. Here's this textile under certain, this is under uh, natural light, but when you analyze it also under uh, magnif magnification and very high intensity light, you get a nice uh, coloration that you'll see. And here's a 2000 year old chromatogram, a beautiful rendition that you also know that this came from a purple pigment. This is under high illumination under the microscope. It's more pinkish, of course. And this, um, like I said, this one is, again, a lot of monobromo indigo. And this is from a dibromo indigo rich trunculus snail. Now, there's also another uh, bluish uh, dye, a biblical blue, what's known as biblical blue a techelet color. And what is that all about? Well, if you take a look at the um, analysis that I did on a certain textile, I'm not showing you the textile yet, but this is what you get. Um, a lot of indigo, a lot of monobromo indigo. So it came from a trunculus and some reddish dibromo indigo. It's just like paints, ladies and gentlemen. Of course, you take blue paint and red paint, obviously you get purple. But if you use a lot of blue paint, you'll get bluish purple. If you use a lot of red, you'll get reddish purple. This comes obviously from an indigo rich trunculus, such as this, you could already see the pigment oozing out of the opening of this particular snail, which is bluish purple or violet. And this is what the textile looked at. Take a look at this beautiful textile, which is a bluish purple or blue violet, whatever color you want to call it. And it's very similar to the color of my favorite precious stone, semi-precious stone, lapis lazuli, the blue stone. But it's really a violet. The high quality ones are more violet, more bluish purple, not just blue in coloration. So in summary, to conclude this particular talk, the snails of the world, Brandara, Sima Stone, and all the others, they primarily give you a reddish pigment because they are very rich in dibromo indigo. However, the trunculus is the most interesting one because it has a nice amount of monobromo indigo, but there are two types of trunculus, which I've written about. There's one that gives you a reddish purple pigment. There's one that gives you a bluish purple pigment. Of course, the uh, ancients could have mixed the two up together, obviously. Um, and they, but they knew from where to get the reddish purple, from which geographical regions, or maybe the size or the sex of the snails, the, without going into all of the details right now, but there are reddish and there's bluish purple pigments. And of course the reddish purple can give you 
uh, dimes like I showed you over here on the high illumination, what is known as Tyrian purple or royal purple or in the biblical argoman. And this one gives you a biblical blue. It's not really blue, it's blue violet or blue purple known as Terechelet. Okay, and now, ah, and now what about the other? So the, so the work, the research that Christopher Hecken and I did showed that what about the other snails, the hemostome and the brandaris, which we know were also used for purple dye? Ah, they were used as color additives. For example, since the trunculus already, the variety gives you reddish purple, but you wanted even a redder purple than the trunculus can give you, then we saw that you can have either brandaris or hemostoma added to it as color additives. To summarize, all archaeological and, and uh, without showing you all the proofs, all archaeological purples uh, that were <laughs> done around the world, but from uh, what I have seen and from my own analyses, all archaeological purples were produced from trunculus species, of either bluish purple or reddish purple. And to produce even redder dyes, the other species were color additives. If you want to check out more archaeological based one, the ASOR uh, videotape, you can see it on YouTube. And also, I gave a TEDx talk Should you kiss with lipstick? I will not give you the answer, no demonstrate it for you. That's all, folks. Thank you very much. And here is the website. I don't hear any applause, but I assume you you enjoyed it also. Here's the website, edelsteincenter.wordpress.com. You can download my articles and other information from that particular website. And uh, a word from our sponsors, our organizers for the next one. Here we go. Diego, take it away. Unmute yourself. Okay. Thank you, Professor Z. Uh, thank you for this presentation. And just before going to the question and answers session, I want you to invite you to the next uh, lecture that will be on December 15 at 3 p.m. Uh, Rome time. And it will be our speaker will be Joseph Glau with the presentation Past, Present, and Future of the Cit of Citizen Heritage Science.